thank you for your kind introduction and uh, good morning everyone. Um, as we know, everything has a bright side and a dark side, so that's spontaneous breeding. And I think you are familiar with the bright side of spontaneous breeding, which is beneficial, of, uh, beneficial effects of spontaneous breeding in, in ARDS. But maybe you are not so familiar with the dark side of spontaneous breeding in ARDS. This is exactly what we have been working on for these five to six years at Osaka, Sao Paulo, and now in Toronto. And now accumulating evidence indicates that spontaneous breeding can also worsen injured lung in a specific situation. So today I will review the evidence to support the harm of spontaneous breeding. And also I would like to discuss when and how spontaneous breeding can be injurious during a mechanical ventilation. Uh, let me start by giving you clinical evidence to support the harm of spontaneous breeding in ARDS patients. This is one of the old case reports showing that preventing strong effort improved oxygenation in ARDS patients. So this is the oxygenation data. The oxygenation was very bad when the ARDS patient preserved very strong spontaneous breathing effort during mechanical ventilations. But after preventing strong spontaneous breathing effort by the induction of muscle paralysis, as you see, the oxygenation improved dramatically in all ARDS patients. And after 20 years have passed, the first randomized clinical trial was done by a group of Dr. Papazian in 2004, showing that preventing spontaneous breathing improved oxygenation in a severe ARDS patients. In terms of inflammations, spontaneous bleeding had no impact on the inflammatory cytokines, but actually muscle paralysis reduced inflammatory cytokines in the VAL as well as in the blood in the severe ARDS patients. And finally, they found that preventing spontaneous breathing improved survival in a severe ARDS patients. So these are the clinical evidence to support that spontaneous breathing can worsen ventilator-induced lung injury. And we can reduce this by paralyzing the ARDS patients. So the next, let's look at when spontaneous breathing can be injurious during a mechanical ventilation. First, spontaneous breathing will be injurious, especially when the effort is very strong during a mechanical ventilations. So they ventilated an ARDS patient with pleasure support of five and people of five. Obviously, the pleasure is within the safe limit. But the problem is that this patient had a very strong spontaneous breathing effort during mechanical ventilations so that they could not control tidal volume nor transpalmary pleasures. In the end, this patient had a bottle trauma like this. So this is very simple but a very important case report supporting that strong spontaneous breathing can be injurious during mechanical ventilation in ARDS patients. And also our animal data support this concept. So strong spontaneous breathing effort worsens hysteroscal lung injury, obviously. And then we can reduce this by decreasing intensity of spontaneous breathing effort. The second is spontaneous breathing will be injurious, especially when the lung, is, uh, lung, in, uh, yeah, when the lung injury is very severe. Looking at the clinical data from a Papazian's trial, Actually, the beneficial effects of muscle paralysis on the mortality was confined to more severe ARDS patients. So there was no difference in the mortality between spontaneous breathing versus paralysis in less severe ARDS patients. And this is also true in our animal study. So in the mild ARDS, paralysis worsens hysteroscal lung injury, but we can prevent this with spontaneous breathing. So we confirmed the beneficial effects of spontaneous breathing in the mild ARDS model. But uh, in the severe ARDS, the impact of spontaneous breathing was totally opposite. So in the severe ARDS, as you see, spontaneous breathing worsens the hysteroscal lung injury, and then we can reduce this by paralyzing the animals in a severe ARDS. So we can see that the impact of spontaneous breathing on a lung injury, either it's good or bad, is depending on the severity of lung injury and also the strength of a spontaneous breathing effort. 
And it is likely that spontaneous breathing worsens lung injury with very strong uncontrollable spontaneous breathing effort and also uh, severe ARDS. So the next, I will describe several mechanisms explaining why strong spontaneous breathing effort can be injurious in a severe ARDS patients. And the first is high transpulmonary pressure, high lung distending pressure due to strong spontaneous breathing effort. First, when your patient is paralyzed during mechanical ventilations, in this case, inspiratory pressures applied to respiratory system is now, is now consumed to inflate the lung as well as chest wall. For this reason, transpulmonary pressure, which is uh, the pressure to inflate the lung, is always less than plateau pressure during paralysis, okay? But this is not the case when your patient preserves strong spontaneous breathing effort during mechanical ventilations. So when the effort is preserved during mechanical ventilation, now two different pressures are combined to inflate the lung. First is positive airway pressure from the ventilator. The second is negative swing, negative change in a pleural pressure generated by diaphragmatic contractions. So when the strong effort is added an already high plateau pressure due to severe ARDS, now the result on the trans pulmonary pressure will be injuriously high. So injuriously high lung distending pressure, of course, worsens ventilator-induced lung injury. And uh, the second is uh, inhomogeneous ventilation pattern, usually observed in severe uh, ARDS when the patient preserves spontaneous breathing. Generally speaking, in the normal healthy lung, Lung distending pressure applied to local pleura, in this case, negative swing in a pleural pressure generated by diaphragmatic contraction is transmitted immediately and uniformly all over the lung surface, creating a fairly uniform increase in the transpulmonary pressure. And this uniform distribution of forces is termed as fluid-like behavior, so that spontaneous breathing can achieve homogeneous ventilation in the normal healthy lung. But this is not the case uh, when the lung is injured very badly, okay? So when the, lung is, uh, when the lung is injured very severely, injured lung does not present fluid-like behavior anymore. In this case, when the patient preserves strong effort during mechanical ventilations, now negative swing in a pleural pressure generated by diaphragmatic contraction is not transmitted to the rest of the lung, but rather concentrated, localized in the dependent part of the lung. Increasing transpulmonary pressure locally in the dependent part of the lung and causing quite a heterogeneous ventilation pattern in a severe ARDS. And we call this heterogeneous ventilation pattern the Pendeloft. So the next, I will show you how Pendev look like using the EIT images. So this was recorded when the patient is paralyzed. So there is no spontaneous breathing and no Pendev, okay? Inflation, deflation, inflation, deflation. So inflate and deflate occurs simultaneously all over the lung field. So inflation is absolutely in phase between lung regions in these situations. But this is not the case when the patient preserves strong effort in a severe ARDS. So when the patient starts to breathe, okay, now, now. So when the patient starts to breathe, first the gas goes into dependent lung regions. It's because spontaneous breathing increases transpulmonary pressure in the dependent part of the lung and then the gas can be distributed to the rest of the lung at the end of inspiration. So inflation is absolutely out of phase between lung regions in this case. And we also analyzed locally a movement uh, during paralysis versus during spontaneous breathing effort. So from top to bottom, the top is airway pressure, esophageal pressure, and uh, local air movement in the non-dependent part of the lung. And the bottom is local air movement in the dependent lung regions. So please pay attention to non-dependent and dependent. First, paralysis. So when to start inflate, non-dependent and dependent, both regions inflate simultaneously 
and the deflate simultaneously. So inflation and deflation is absolutely in phase between lung regions, which does make sense. But uh, when the patient preserves strong effort in a severe ARDS, now we observe two key differences. First, spontaneous breathing increased in inflation of dependent lung regions, which magnitude is almost twice than during muscle paralysis, despite the same tidal volume. So this is the key. The second, this early inflation of dependent lung regions was accompanied by simultaneous deflation of non-dependent lung regions. So this suggests that the movement of air from non-dependent to dependent lung regions during diaphragmatic contraction. This is why we call this heterogeneous ventilation pattern the penderoft. And also one more important thing that I need to add is this. This magnitude of dependent lung inflation caused by strong effort is actually equal to that applied by tidal volume of 15 ml per kilogram during muscle paralysis. So that we can say that penderoft is an injurious inflation pattern to cause local bottle trauma in the dependent part of the lung. We cannot prevent this by limiting tidal volume. The only way to reduce this local bottle trauma is by reducing strength of spontaneous breathing effort. And, um, and also, strong effort causes not only local bottle trauma, but also a huge tidal recruitment at the entire dependent lung regions. And we found this by using these dynamic CAT scan images. So this was uh, obtained when the strong effort was preserved during VCV. So tidal volume was absolutely fixed at five to six ml per kilogram, okay? Pay attention to dependent lung regions. So at the end of expiration, now, now. So at the end of expiration, dependent lung is colored gray. Gray means collapsed. So at, at the end of expression, dependent lung is extensively collapsed. It's because this is severe ARDS model. But next, at the end of inspiration, now, 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 okay? At the end of inspiration, dependent lung previously collapsed is now aerated. So this is what we call tidal recruitment, or you can say cyclic collapse. And as we know, the tidal recruitment and uh, cyclic collapse is one of the important mechanisms for the ventilator induced lung injury. So strong effort causes not only local bottle trauma, but also a huge tidal recruitment at the entire dependent part of the lung. And this injurious inflation pattern caused by strong effort was totally different from during muscle paralysis. And I will show you by using this uh, dynamic CT. So this was recorded during paralysis, but venti uh, uh, mechanical ventilation settings were absolutely the same. So VCV and the tidal volume was fixed at five to six. Only difference is now paralysis, and the other one is spontaneous breathing. So now you will realize that there is almost no change in the lung aeration during respiratory cycles in the dependent part of the lung. It's because during paralysis, most of ventilation, most of tidal volume is now shifted to non-dependent lung regions. And here it is very important to stress this concept. Injury occurs where the gas goes. So the next, let's look at the distribution of inflammation by using FDG PET techniques. So during paralysis, as you see, the inflammation predominantly occurs in the non-dependent part of the lung, where typically receives most of ventilation during muscle paralysis. This is spontaneous breathing. So look at this. Spontaneous breathing increased inflammation extensively. So inflammation occurs not only in the non-dependent, but also now it's expanding to dependent lung regions. It's because strong effort causes local bottle trauma and also huge tidal recruitment at the entire dependent part of the lung. And uh, the next question is, okay, so how we can reduce, how we can prevent 
the harm of spontaneous breathing in a severe ARDS patient. So this is our next question. And uh, one established treatment is, of course, early paralysis, which was described by Dr. Papazian. But looking at this data from lung safe trial, um, the use of neuromuscular blocking agent was less than 40% in the severe ARDS patient. So when I look at this data, I have a feeling that physicians are somewhat reluctant to use neuromuscular booking agent even in a severe ARDS patient. And I think it's mainly because the use of neuromuscular booking agent can potentially cause muscle atrophy. So this is our concern. And uh, in this case, we needed to find another way to decrease strong spontaneous breathing effort during mechanical ventilation while maintaining some muscle activity. And actually, we can achieve this goal with PEEP. Okay, and I will show you uh, with this representative case. So this patient was ventilated with PCV. PEEP was five. Negative swing in esophageal pressure was 10 to zero, so let's say minus 10. So at the PEEP of five, this patient had a very strong spontaneous breathing effort. And then what we did is to increase the PEEP from five to 15. Negative swing in esophageal pressure was reduced from minus 10 to minus 5. So we can decrease strong spontaneous breathing effort by increasing PEEP instead of by using a neuromuscular booking agent. And uh, the same phenomenon was already described in a classical papers. So this is one of the papers. So as you see, as end expiratory lung volume was increased, it's like a PEEP effect, spontaneous breathing effort was reduced linearly. And um, in, terms of, in terms of ventilation pattern, strong effort at low peep caused pender, as we saw before. So inflation was absolutely out of phase between lung regions. So that tidal volume first goes into dependent lung regions and then it causes a local borrow trauma and a tidal recruitment in the dependent part of the lung. But uh, this is the high PEEP. So high PEEP obviously reduced Penderoft by decreasing spontaneous breathing effort. The point is that now inflation is in phase between lung regions so that tidal volume can be distributed all over the lung regions in the high PEEP. And then we did a long experiment to evaluate if high PEEP can really reduce spontaneous breathing effort for a long duration. And then it can lead to reduce lung inflammation or not in the severe ARDS model. So low PEEP, negative swing in esophageal pressure was 10, oh sorry, minus 10 for 16 hours. So this means that in low PEEP, very strong effort was preserved for 16 hours. In contrast, high PEEP can maintain spontaneous breathing to be a modest level, which is around minus four for 16 hours. And then this is, a this is the distribution of inflammations after ventilating for 16 hours. So strong effort at low PEEP obviously increased inflammation in the dependent part of the lung. It's because, again, strong effort causes local border trauma and also a huge tidal recruitment at the entire dependent part of the lung. This is the high PEEP. So high PEEP can reduce lung inflammation, especially in the dependent part of the lung by decreasing strong spontaneous breathing effort. And um, before closing my talk, I would like to introduce this very important concept, which is patient can hurt themselves by their spontaneous breathing. So first, initial lung injury occurs, like a pneumonia or a trauma or something. And then it causes capillary leak and also lung edema. And lung edema uh, always worsens gas exchange and worsens lung mechanics. Lower oxygenation, higher PaCO2, and a lower lung compliance usually increases respiratory drive of the ARDS patients. So severe lung injury and the strong spontaneous breathing effort. They are closely related with each other and then both work together to worsen already injured lung with several mechanisms that we discussed today. This is what we call vicious cycle of spontaneous breathing, vicious cycle. So we have to stop this vicious cycle of spontaneous breathing by 
reducing strong spontaneous breathing effort and also by improving lung mechanics with the adequate level of PEEP. So I think this would be one of the um, uh, effective strategy to decrease the harm of spontaneous breathing in a severe ALS patients. And uh, my talk is also summarized in this perspective, which was uh, just published in the Blue Journal this year. So if you're interested in the role of spontaneous breathing, uh, please take a look at this perspective as well. Thank you for your kind uh, attention. <laughs>